Thank you all for joining me. Uh, I really do appreciate you taking the time to uh, sit here and listen to me talk. Um, so I know that <clears throat> I'm in between you and beer, so feel free to come and go as you please to get some more. Um, I have, uh, I'm actually really happy to be here because I actually grew up in Montreal, I, actually just outside Montreal in DDO. So anytime I get a chance to come back here and talk, I always love it because I always feel like it feels very like home when I'm here. Um, but yeah, so anyway, I'm here to talk about a distributed denial of service. Uh, I work for a little company called Akamai Technologies, and we tend to deal with that a whole lot. Um, it's really interesting when you think about it that everybody in this room, at some point in the last 30 days, your IP address ended up in our log files, at least once. Something to wrap your head around. Anyway, so who am I and why am I standing here talking to you? Uh, well, I have, before I came to Akamai, I did 20 years in the trenches. I spent um, a lot of time in three different banks, two power companies, uh, military contracting, and so on and so forth. And I have all the scar tissue to show for it. It was a, a long ride, and I enjoyed it in retrospect. <laughs> and all along the way, I kept lots of copious files and lots of uh, notebooks. So as a result, I'm actually able to go back and pull stories from there, sanitize them, and then use them for when I write uh, for a couple of publications, CSO Online and Forbes makes it rather interesting. So what I'm going to talk to you today about, I'm going to go over you know, some high level, high level ideas here. We're going to talk about the actors you know, as part of threat modeling like Robert was talking about in the last talk. We're going to talk about attacks, the type of tools that attackers are using, because one of the things that I noticed a while ago was anytime I ever saw an article in the media, it was, it was a denial of service. But they never really dig down into what it is. Um, I'm not going to dig too deep, but at least I'm going to get you know, touch on the subject. Um, as well, we're going to look at trends that we see evolving because one of the things that we do at Akamai is we do this thing called the State of the Internet Report. Funny enough, when you have 30, uh, about 30% of the Internet going across your platform at any given point, if you take out pornography, we have 80%, um, then we get a lot of data. And one of the really cool things is we've been going through and parsing out this data, and it's an evolutionary process, so about a year from now, you're going to see some really amazing reports coming out, and I hope that you, know, you can drive value from those. So that's one of those things. As well, um, in addition to the data, we're also going to talk, I'm just going to talk about high level of things that you can do. Yes, I know I'm a vendor. We sell something, but it's more along the lines of things that you should be doing for your sites now, notwithstanding vendor guys standing up here yakking at you. But first, I want to talk about a little PSA that has nothing to do about denial of service. Uh, this morning, I got hit with this. I'm a vendor, this drives me nuts. This drove me nuts when I was on the other side of the phone for 20 years. This was a company that reached out and said, oh look, you got a chance to win 200 euros, was it 200 euros? Yeah, 200 euros if you fill out this questionnaire, da da da. Um, don't do this. If you work for a vendor, please don't do this. Rather irritated because, you know, I have a temper. Anyway, so that being said, uh, I'm gonna talk about some of the, a the actors that you have to deal with and as it falls into your own threat model. And in this case, the first one out of the, big, out of the box <clears throat> are your mercenary types, your hackers for hire. And there are lots of groups out there in the various underground forums that are actually available for hire to attack sites. Uh, one gentleman who was in the C-suite for a company, um, this was going back about 10 years ago, he hired one of these teams to attack his competitor. The thing he didn't take into account was that when this crew was eventually caught, the FBI flipped them and he ratted them out and he got to go to jail for a long period of time. I do, reg I do regret that I can't remember his name. I seem to have lost that part of my data. But anyway, Max Vision, Max Vision? I, there we go. So, thank you. Um, and yes, you feel free to throw things at me verbally uh, as we go along. So this is a, an underground market list. This is actually two years out of date, so I apologize for that. But you can look at, this is a, a menu item. So you can go through and say, okay, I want a, one, one of these, one of those, one of those, and you know, I'll get the uh, tiramisu to go. So you can look at the price points here. And for example, with a DDoS attack, this is two years ago, mind you, you know, 30 to 70 bucks a day, or you know, $1,200 a month. I don't know what the monthly package would be, and it'd be probably rather substantial at that point. So there was money to be made in these underground forums for this sort of activity. <clears throat> now, the upside is that we now have, the other side of the phone is now available. We actually have hackers for hire 
So a, an amalgamation of yourselves that can be hired out for various projects. Rather cool project. I, I don't know too much about this particular project. I only found out about it today, and I thought it was worthy to bring up something to have a look at. That's the hackers list. Now, after you look at the, the, hire, the hackers for hire on the negative side of things, you also have to look at these guys. The bored kids at home that are sitting in their parents' basement eating Doritos and pissed off at the universe. These are kids with access to tools, access to the internet, a lot of free time, and there's a lot of them. So if they get bored and they get a tool that they can play with, they can be leveraged into a rather substantial force. Um, and, and also, you have to look at it, the, the thought processes that go into it when you're someone, you know, 15 years old sitting at home and nothing better to do. Like, there was a kid in London, Ontario, who was arrested not too long ago. When Heartbleed came out, he said, oh, great, I'll take Heartbleed and I'll beat up on Revenue Canada. Not the greatest idea. So he went there and he was digging away at it all day long. They had so much information on they showed up the next day and arrested him. And he's, he's basically thrown his life away. I don't know his particular age. Uh, I believe it was 18, actually, which is not good for him. But the thought process wasn't there where it was a fully formed idea of, wait a minute, maybe this is a bad idea. Maybe I shouldn't be doing this. And there's so many of these kids out there that need better guidance that it, it really worries me that they might get leveraged into a cohesive force that can be used to attack somebody. And possibly somebody had that idea. And this is a perfect example. Uh, Anonymous was able to come up with some tools and said, here you go, join the fray. And lots of people jumped in and they used these tools and attacked various sites. And I'll get into that a little bit more later on. Now, <clears throat> when you're dealing with hacktivists and the like, these are the chaotic actors. You're never sure exactly what you're gonna get next. And we've seen Anonymous have some campaigns that were, you know, a worthy note, and other campaigns where everybody stood there and went, you're doing what now? And it really got, got really interesting. And that's the problem when you call yourselves anonymous, anybody and their brother can hang up a shingle and say, I'm anonymous. So you have that decentralization, the chaotic aspect. Most times they're politically and socially motivated, but it's only most of the time, not all the time. Then we have the nation state actors. These guys are fun. These are lots of fun. Uh, we've seen you know, the, the famous PLA 61398 crew uh, that was you know, tearing apart the United States and everybody else under the sun. Um, I actually worked in an organization who we had an office roughly two blocks from their headquarters in China. Uh, they had owned one of our systems nine ways from Sunday, or at least we suspect it was them. Couldn't fully prove it, obviously, because attribution. Anyway, um, another one that I've taken to mind is the Alcasam cyber fighters um, from a couple of years ago who decided to attack every financial institution under the sun in the United States. One of the things that we found really interesting with these guys was that they failed geography. They attacked all of the Canadian financial institutions because they figured we're, you know, we must be the same country. I, I, yeah, anyway. So, as a result, um, they were using a, a tool called Brobot. And Brobot was a set of PHP scripts that they would actually use on infected WordPress sites. And then they could use these and they could customize the code and use all of these WordPress sites as a distributed denial of service tool. It was kind of ingenious the way it worked, and it was very effective. And you know, there was a known list of IP addresses that they had, so there was a, you know, the ability to block them. But as these robot networks grew, more IP addresses would pop up. And <clears throat> they could do UDP, do UDP floods, application attacks, and with, you know, doing denial of service with random query strings. And they were, had demonstrated the ability to change on the fly. So if a defense was put in place, they figured out actually, okay, I'll change this and you know, up yours. Um, and, and, and these guys became very difficult, but it was really interesting that when the new Iranian government came into power, didn't see them again. It was rather interesting. Um, I heard rumors about a year ago that they had popped back up again, but nobody was able to substantiate that. But it seems that they were swept away um, officially anyway. So that brings me to the attacks. 
The type of attacks that we see a lot of, obviously, are volumetric based. Saw that coming. Uh, application layer and protocol based attacks. Here are some samples of some of these attacks. Um, on our own network, it, like for example, SIN floods and UDP floods, we just, uh, actually an ICMP floods for that matter. <coughs> Pardon me. We actually drop them at the perimeter and they never make it to the origin systems. Not a product pitch. Um, and we also see a lot of amplification attacks. These things drive me nuts, especially when you look at it from NTP, because that was an avoidable problem. This was actually because of old code that was able to be used to uh, amplify an attack signal and hit all these sites. But if these libraries have been updated, the problem wouldn't have been there per se. And good old HTTP floods. So being a fan of StarCraft when I was uh, in, well, a long time ago, um, one of the things that always drove me nuts when I was playing the game was every once in a while, these guys would show up. Anybody in here familiar with StarCraft or have I just dated myself? Oh, I've got a few. <laughs> so these guys would swarm in, hundreds of them, tear everything up, and I'm like, okay, great, I've got to start all over again. And that's sort of the frame of reference that I have when looking at denial of service attacks because they're trying to exhaust your resources. They're trying to take your systems down and render them unusable for your customers, your users, yourself. And it's really frustrating in that respect. But there's not just, boom, here's a dial of service, move on. There's all kinds of variations. And I apologize because I'm fairly certain that that is an eye chart. A little bit. But anyway, this is from the first quarter of this year. And these are the tags that we were able to parse out from our data. The number one biggest one of these was SSDP attacks. And this is you know, from the Universal Plug and Play, and I'll dig into that a little bit more later. But as on top of that, we had SYN and UDP, were the, so that was the top three. One of the really interesting things is I wrote an article about you know, SSDP attacks a while ago, and I've been getting a nonstop barrage of emails from the Universal Plug and Play Consortium. There's actually a group that, I guess an industry lobby group for them. And they are constantly sending me emails trying to get me to correct that article because it's perfectly secure. Sure, let's go with that. So SSDP is a simple service discovery protocol. It's basically, you know, plug, play, move on, get your devices. Everything should just work. However, this is actually something that can be used in leveraging denial of service attacks. And they make very attractive reflectors. So yeah, obligatory cat pictures. <laughs> then the next in the line that we look at, we have application layer attacks. So if you have a web application where, you know, username, password, or some sort of input box, if you're not sanitizing your data inputs as well as outputs, people can throw arbitrary strings into your data and they can cause all manner of trouble. And for one example here, let's see where does I put it. Uh, yeah, so they're, they're trying to exhaust your resources or in cases where they can get away with it, pop your data. So if they can get your intellectual property, if they can get your customers, if they can get your users, whatever it happens to be, depending on your site, that's bad. So these are things that need to be addressed. Now, when we're looking at application layer attacks, in our data for Q1 of this year, only about 10% of all the attacks were application-based. The vast majority of them were denial of service and a volumetric nature. Now, these, um, these application layer ones were uh, primarily <coughs> HTTP GET attacks, were 7% of that data. And the other, yeah, the other 91% of it, as we were talking about, as I was talking about before, let me see right here, are all directed at infrastructure. So the funny thing is with the infrastructure based attacks, the vast majority of them, here we go with the attribution game, the vast majority of them based on IP address originated in China. Now, when we switch to this one, the vast majority of these attacks, 52% of them originated in the United States. Okay, interesting. Infrastructure, China, web apps, United States. Um, and when these attacks were launched, they were usually, you know, get floods using a combination of Joomla and WordPress installs that had been compromised and get floods that were piped over proxies. <clears throat> now, last year, we saw, and these are public, so I mean, I'm not giving anything away by saying this, 
Um, there were sites Feedly, Meet, Meetup, Basecamp, and GitHub all had been hit by a group saying, if you don't pay us a certain amount of money, we're going to launch a denial of service and hold you down. And thankfully, I, as far as I know, all of them told them to saw it off and move on. But the really interesting thing was the price point that was being demanded. In one particular instance, all of them wanted Bitcoin, but in one particular instance, they only wanted $150. And I was, I was like, okay, this is kind of peculiar. It's such a low price point. Why are they, t oh, wait, well, hold on. This is a trial run. Somebody's testing out their machine. And sure enough, it turns out that that group has resurfaced this year. That group is, we, is I call DD4BC. And we wrote up a, a, a report on these guys after doing extensive analysis on their attacks. And they didn't like that very much. So the sites that they were attacking that were primarily North American and Europe, they just stopped talking. They didn't want press, and they got it. So as a result, they've actually shifted their sphere of attacks to Asia-Pacific region, which is rather interesting to see. So, <clears throat> and as well, the price has gone up dramatically. And when, what happens is, if you don't pay the price, they launch the attack, and the price triples if you want them to stop the attack. However, if you have protections in place, like us or whoever, um, then they tend to leave you alone. So with amplification attacks, we're seeing you know, the primary ones being NTP, SNMP, DNS, as, ampl as amplifying platforms, it, it was really interesting to see some of the orders of magnitude that could be accomplished with these and rather amazing in some cases, especially with NTP. Now, with these amplification attacks, another one that we saw was a DNS text-based attack that was used to increase uh, the amplification rate. And the, the, the reason that they were able to do that is they actually took text from a, uh, a release, I believe it was from the White House, and embedded it in, in order to amplify the attack by sending more data. And it was really interesting that when they did this, they were able to amplify the responses because of this. And it was not limited to just DNS servers, but here's a sample packet. Um, I don't know if you can read it from there, but this is a sample packet. So, for example, here, seeing uh, the MX record, SMT, da da da, President Obama is taking action to help ensure all of it. Wait a minute, what? So, they were making a political statement at the same time that they were causing this kind of trouble. So, what are the tools that are getting used here? One of the interesting things about the tools that are being used is that the barrier for entry into this field is getting lower and lower every day. We see so many tools that come out there point and click. It's like my mother can use them. My mother hasn't figured out Skype yet. I'm lucky in that respect, but if she, this is even easier than Skype in some of these cases. And within the weapons locker, you're looking at obviously volumetric tools, you're looking at SQL injection tools, and so on and so forth. This tool, anybody familiar with this one? This has been around for a bit. This one is really easy. You take this, you point it at a site, you go click. If, they're, if it's vulnerable to SQL injection, you've got a very high probability that it's going to work. It's rather remarkable how simple this tool is to use. And we, saw, we still see this actually today quite frequently popping up. Uh, cra you know, they craft recursive queries and overwhelm the database, as well as you know, they overwhelm the application server in some cases. And then we have the Hulk. This is actually a couple years old. The Hulk was an HTTP, uh, well, the name means HTTP Unbearable Load King. Yeah, stretching there. Um, and, and what it would do is it would do HTTP GET requests against the site in the, in the hopes of taking it down because you know chewing up all the resources. And one of the best ways to do with something like this, or actually any HTTP GET based attack, is you know doing IP rate limiting in whatever fashion is available to you to accomplish that. And it was interesting with this tool, they were able to obfuscate the clients, um, the source client. And they were, had a list of strings where they could actually vary it up and say, you know, it's this, it's that, whatever type of browser. And the really interesting thing is if you didn't know any better, I probably can't see this, let me have a look here. Hmm. Um, with this particular list, this is actually a request that would come in from Hulk against one of your systems. So this would be something that your system would be seeing. There's really not a whole lot to sell it off. It says user agents, Mozilla 5.0, and so on and so forth. It is 
only when you see thousands of these coming in that you realize you have a problem. So it becomes really interesting to deal with in that particular tool. Now, another tool that we saw, I quite like this one actually in the, the way that it was set up. This is Tor's Hammer. This is just a Python script, it's very simple. Um, and the whole premise here is to do a low and slow attack against the site, but doing it over a Tor network to obfuscate their point of origin. Um, and unfortunately for them, in some cases, whenever this got used, it would actually you know, drop a lot of uh, exit nodes because of just the sheer volume of traffic, so it sort of backfired on them in, in many ways. <coughs> Excuse me. It was very simple to use. It's still available today. But you just launch it, pick the IP address, and pick the number of threads you want, off it goes. However, you would really annoy uh, Runa and the rest of the Tor crew if you did that. <laughs> And it would do a slow post DDoS testing, so it's, the whole premise of it is it's for testing, but obviously people will take that and play wonderful games with it. And there was this cute little guy. This is Donut. Donut is another HTTP GET type tool. Um, it's simple, you can just throw junk data at a site uh, doing HTTP requests. And the idea is to be a, have it as a flutter. It was sort of a precursor to um, uh, other tools that I'll talk about in a second. And here's another sample. This is the traffic that you would see coming in from Donut. And <coughs> it's fairly innocuous on the face of it. But, you know, you see thousands and thousands of those requests come in, you know that something is up. So again, that was another one for uh, rate limiting would help. Now this is the one that always got me. Going back to the kids we were talking about sitting in their parents' basement. Huge available workforce for somebody with a nefarious end. I give you low orbit ion cannon. Um, this has been around for a while now, but one of the things that all the kids and other parties that were using this didn't realize is it didn't cover your tracks at all. But then again, the group that put it out didn't care if you covered your tracks. It wasn't, they weren't doing it. Like, oh no, there you go attack them. So they would have a distributed denial of service, like their own meat space botnet, for want of a better term, where they could attack sites. And knuckleheads would download it, click the button, and go. And they're like, hey, look at me, I'm hacking. Until the police showed up. So evolution being what it is, this tool came out a little bit later. This is a high orbit ion cannon. <laughs> Gotta love these names. <laughs> and again, it's back to the HTTP get method for the attack tool. This seemed to be the default thread through all of these tools, the point and click tools, is it's always HTTP GET traffic. That amount of traffic is actually fairly low in the grand scheme of things with denial of service platforms, and I'll get to that in a little bit as to why. Now, this is the one that was by far the most effective one, and I was talking about it earlier, is Brobot. It's a PHP Trojan installed on Word, primarily WordPress sites, but it had various other sites that it could actually compromise as well, and they could do all manner of things with this. It was, Pretty, pretty cool for its time when it first rolled out. And it's essentially been quiet since then, but we still uh, keep an eye on them. And then there was the news not too long ago that various government agencies decided that WGET was a hacker tool. <laughs> I don't get it. I just don't get it. Um, and th this is one of the things that I worry about with you know, law enforcement, various political parties, things like that. These are the folks that are making the legislation that we all have to live with. And when they think that WGET is a, an attack tool, that worries me. I could say, yes, I have a hammer, it's an attack tool. I can smack you in the head, but that's not its intended purpose. So it's not so much the tool as the purpose behind it. Are you a criminal or are you not a criminal? That's a different differentiator. Uh, I was going to talk about Beast, but I have to be honest, I uh, meant to take this slide out. So I'll let you read that for a second. I had neglected to remove that one. Now, now we're going to get into some of the trends. And this is one of the really cool thing about having all this data is we can see the evolution of things as it goes along. The one thing that has really popped out, especially in the last six months, are these guys. There is no shortage of this nonsense going on, and it may rhyme with Izzard Squad. Um, this is one of the prime examples because these guys would attack sites, they attack various gaming networks and all that sort of thing, but they didn't know enough to shut up. So a lot of them have actually found themselves incarcerated and probably won't see daylight for a very long time. 
these sort of attacks really started to spin up in the fall of last year and hit their stride right about just after Christmas when they rolled out their lizard stressor platform, which I'll talk to you about a little bit more in, in a moment. And they always seem to be really focused on gaming. And when you look at the ages of the folks that are getting arrested, you realize that is because that is that group. They are gamers. This is what they want. They want to smack their friends. It sort of harkens back to um, you know, 10 years ago when you had people defacing websites. You had all DOS and attrition and all the rest of them were actually keeping archives of these things. It would always be, ha, 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 I hacked you, shouts out to my peeps, and that sort of thing. And this seems to have taken that behavior and evolved it to this, which then brings us to the commoditization of denial of service, distributed denial of service. This is something I'm seeing a lot more of, where you see these SaaS offerings for attack platforms. Of course, they put lipstick on it and call it something else, but that's ostensibly exactly what they are. Now, this is a perfect example because they were very good at getting in front of the media. They're still around to some extent. It seems to have become more of a brand like anonymous, a hex sign, if you will. Um, and they offered this service for a very low amount of money. And the lowest part of the service offering being six bucks a month. The really funny thing was they built it on somebody else's code. It was actually from a group called Titanium. They, built, they took their code, installed it, set it up, did not put any sort of HTTP access files on any of their directories, and also you were able to index all of the users on the system. And then, I, I wish I had written this up because a month later Brian Krebs wrote about it and everybody went, oh really? So here is, um, from the Lizard Stressor one, here is actually some of their pricing packages. And funny thing is, they're very similar to the pricing packages that Titanium had. The really funny thing is that in the uh, 7,200 second model in the bottom right there, that's $69.99 a month. So you take a month, say 30 days, divided by that, you're looking at $2.33 a day. To put that in perspective, an Ameri a grande Americano at Starbucks is $2.55. Less than a cup of coffee a day, you're able to cause trouble. Now, this is where we get into booters and stressors, and these have very different etymologies. Now, the booter comes from the online gaming world where you're able to actually find the information about somebody they're playing against and you want to get their IP address, their username, whatever it happens to be, so that you can target them for the next step of the attack. And these sort of rivalries would escalate to massive denial of services that would take out all kinds of other uh, sites as well. And it was really frustrating to see this sort of activity because so many other people are getting impacted because of these petty little turf wars. Now, after you had gone through and done the booter part of it, you had the stressor. This is actually really amusing that they call it a stressor because it's actually using it as a legal artifact. The reason they use this is to say, oh, well, we're providing this platform to stress test your environment under the idea that if you're attacking somebody, they can go, oh, we're not doing the attack. They're actually misusing our platform. And, well, it didn't work out so well for all of them. Um, so it, it provides them with the appearance that they're operating within the legal limits, and they really are pushing the limits at that point. Here is a list of some of the stressors and booters that are available out there. It, it's a relatively recent, um, and not all of them are good. Some of them are very, very good, and some of them are absolute shite. Now, this next video that I'm going to give you, let's see if this works. This shows you the levels that they're willing to go to set up their service to look like a legitimate business. Incidentally, Big Bang Booter, I'll give them credit, that's a pretty neat name. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently this platform is complete crap, so don't waste your Bitcoin on them. Uh, I, some of our other researchers have played with this one, not myself. So they go through and they give you a rundown of the various components that they can do, the types of attacks they can do. You, know, you can hit like a boss. <laughs> awesome. And I'm just going to let this run for a little bit because there's a piece that it comes up in just a minute that absolutely made me hysterical. And we're almost there. Are we there? The untraceable servers. Yeah, okay. What internet are you working on? So th at that point, they, this was uh, when they first made this, it was eight. Yeah, there it is. 24-7 friendly support. <laughs> Great. Awesome. 
this is absolute nonsensical gibberish. Now, this actually goes to show the lengths that they're willing to go. This is some pretty slick production values they've got going there. I'll give them credit. That's kind of neat. I wish I could do that sort of thing. Um, but it, it just shows you to lengths they're willing to go to try and make it look like a legitimate business. But it's anything but. So some other highlights that we're seeing as well. Um, Joomla and other type of SaaS-based apps are being routinely targeted, and obviously because they want to try and extend their platforms so that they can actually get people to pay for this with the Bitcoin. Uh, with, with the Bitcoin. Um, and, uh, data breaches are a big problem, obviously, because a lot of replay attacks are happening, and we're seeing this far too often, because people like to use the same password over and over again. I get why, because people don't remember passwords. That's why I have a password management tool, because that way I only have to remember one. However, most people don't have that wherewithal, and this is where we have to do a better job of educating people, saying, you know, don't reuse your password, because these crews can get them, launch attacks, get resources, or even compromise systems. It's a problem that you have to take into account. All right, now the wonderful attribution game. So this is something that always drives me crazy, but based on the data, we're able to show that the predominant number of attacks against infrastructure originated in China, in the logs. Whether or not they actually came from China is another thing. The reason I say that is because I worked in an organization roughly about 10 years ago where we came under attack, a withering attack by a IP address from China. We actually worked with the ISP in China to actually track it down. They were actually very helpful, which I was always led to believe that it wouldn't be the case, but they really were very helpful. Now, when we went through this whole process, we found that it was just an open relay, and all the original source traffic was actually coming from Europe. So they were actually coming through there to attack us. Why they were attacking us, no real idea, because we weren't an e-commerce site, we weren't retail, anything like that. But sometimes somebody's annoyed for whatever reason. So just in this first quarter of the year, this is how the attack traffic broke out by geo, geolocation. So Germany, for whatever reason, was number two, which is really interesting because I'm fairly certain they outlawed these kind of tools there. See how that works out. And with all of these attacks, it kind of begs the question, who is suffering as a result of these attacks? Now, in the first quarter, these are attacks that were based, uh, basically over 100 gigabits per second. And something I forgot to mention, with those platforms, the booters and stressors, originally they were able to do about 30 gigs per second as an attack. Not, not too bad. Definitely formidable against a smaller site. But in the last few months, they've been able to actually amp that up to over 100 gigabits per second. We're figuring based on that, that by next year they'll be able to do 300 or so. Which is, it's, so it's becoming a real problem. Now, within these verticals, the one that actually got hit the most was gaming. Big shocker there. And it, 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 it's ever increasing. This isn't actually slacking off. Now, within the application layer's perspective in our data, we went through and we looked at the information that really showed us something that was unexpected. Retail was the number one subject of these type of attacks. And it, it seemed to be really contrasting to what we'd known in the past because before it was financial institutions were the target of these sort of things. But I think it's more the case of the attackers went, okay, these financial institutions are tired of us and they've actually put in uh, security measures in place to actually rebuff us. So let's go attack retail, soft underbelly, easier target. And then we've seen all of these you know, point of sale breaches and all the rest of it. Not that there are two are necessarily uh, related. So that's how the data broke out for the first quarter as to the types of verticals that were actually getting hit. And hotels and motels get hit a lot as well, and we've seen some very public breaches in the news. And as I was <laughs> that's okay. I'm now talking over top of myself, I apologize. So yes, again, uh, the top amount of t uh, IP, ba based on IP, the attacks that were application-based were 52% coming out of the United States. And with these types of attacks, we saw huge sin floods. And this is a sample of a packet that we got. Um, and this was absolutely withering attack, but with our platform we were able to deal with it. But if you aren't properly protected, this sort of thing would just take you out. And this is only one part of the puzzle. 
whenever you see these major attacks that hit the news, it's not just one protocol they're hitting and like, click and move on. They're actually hitting you from various different types of platforms, be it over HTTP, over uh, ICMP, whatever will work. They'll throw the kitchen sink at you if they think it's going to play out. And then I'll just put this up there for your own reading edification, just to break out of the types of numbers and uh, things that we're seeing rather than speak to it. Now, other observations are these seven attack vectors accounted for 179 million attacks in the first quarter. It's by no means an entire list, but these are the seven possible ones. I say popping shells, but this command injection, I just thought it sounded better. Um, so I'll go through some of these as well, and obviously Java, I think is very much maligned. I think it's actually one of the best remote access platforms on the planet. SQL injection is a problem that I don't know why we're still talking about this. This has been on the OWASP top 10 for over a decade. Yet here we are, because sites get stood up all the time. They're not sanitizing their inputs. They're not sanitizing their outputs. This is a real problem. Why can't we get this right? And I often wonder if it's a case of, are we talking to the wrong audience? We're talking to each other. We get it. But maybe we should be talking to the app dev, getting a wider audience, going to conferences we don't necessarily talk at, and you know, going out of our comfort zone to actually talk to them because the application developers need to hear this. We need to actually do a better job of getting that information out there because this is a very much a solvable problem. Now, when we looked at the data, this is uh, SQL injection attacks as well as uh, local file inclusion attacks and how the data broke out over the year, and again, or over the first quarter, my apologies. So again, retail is getting wailed on. Now, this is a very real problem. And obviously, media and ent entertainment came up a uh, close second there. And one of the examples with the LFI attacks is they go after things that are going to break. And WordPress plugins are a great target. One particular WordPress, tar uh, WordPress plugin, I'll get that out eventually, is uh, the Re Rev Slider. I haven't used this one personally, but I've looked at it, and it actually looks pretty nice from a visual type of uh, aspect. But this had a vulnerability where you could actually upload your own shell. Bit of a problem, really. And this led to a massive uh, number of sites being compromised. In March alone, we saw 75 million attacks for LFI type of uh, approach. And we see scanners going, looking for this sort of thing all the time. And whenever we see a site that's actually being scanned extensively, we know that What's coming next is they're going to try and do file upload and eventually launch a denial of service or pop the site. So it, it, it's, it's good to know that we're able to see these hallmarks moving forward as to, you know, this is the type of behavior we see leading up to the attack because people do their recon. And this is a, these are four examples of sites that are typically targeted for malicious upload. Now, for these four, look at the dates on two of them. The CVEs for two of them are 2008 in 2009. We put out this data, actually we published this two days ago. So these, these are attacks that are ongoing now and the problem is, is people that maintain these sites don't necessarily have a security person. I was able to give a talk at Interop a few weeks ago and I had a room of about 100 CIOs and I said, of this room, how many people has a dedicated security person? Four hands went up out of a room of 100 people. So this is why these sort of things work, because they don't have the resources or the ability to actually address this sort of thing, and it's a real problem. Website hygiene is a very real problem that has to be addressed. Now, when we look at the, up, uh, the data from the perspective of looking at uh, malicious file uploads and PHP attacks and that sort of thing, this is how it played out for the first quarter. The Command injections were the most frequently targeted against uh, media and entertainment. And Java attacks were actually down, and I can show you some of those, which is really funny because Java is Java, so I'm surprised they don't leverage this more. Or maybe it's that sort of uh, information set is you know, falling out of fashion where people are educated in other types of formats. Now, when you're dealing with all this sort of thing, you want to make sure that with your own systems, you're not falling into the bucket of being part of an undead army. And this is something that I worry about a lot because you want to, one, avoid having your system as part of one of these networks, but the reason you want to have that is not so much that, well, it's part of the network, but at some point, law enforcement or some sort of organization is going to say, 
well, you're actually liable for that attack traffic. I haven't seen that pop up yet, but I'm worried that that will eventually come, especially when I hear uh, rhetoric from the US about it making you know, security research illegal, or at least tightly controlled. Um, that worries me to no end. So what can you do about all of this? First, take a sip of water. And yes, I realize that I work for a vendor in this space and I'm not doing a sales pitch, but like I was saying before, SQL injections, this is a solvable problem. We need to fix this. We need to actually look at hardening your systems, making sure that you don't have open configurations or something simple like one of those uh, malicious file upload vulnerabilities that could have been fixed that has been around for years. Work with your ISP to talk about mitigation strategies. They're the next hop upstream from you. So if you have a site that you're worried about going down, talk to them. They may have some sort of solution in place. It's worth the talk. Use access control lists as well as bogon lists on your uh, edge routers so that you can actually dump IP addresses into oblivion that you're not having any interest in. Um, so if you say you don't want to deal with attack traffic coming out of Ukraine or whatever it happens to be, you can null route them into oblivion and not have to worry about it for, to an extent. Obviously, it's not a 100% solution. As you all know, there's no 100% solutions in security. Um, but these are things that will help, especially IP rate limiting. So if you're under attack, um, there are different methods to do that as well. The one thing that absolutely drives me bonkers, patch at your systems. This is one of the biggest things that drives me absolutely to distraction. I look at breach notifications that go out every year, um, well, all, for the last year I was looking at them, and publicly disclosed information going through them. The vast majority of them, the reason these breaches were successful was because the system was not patched to current or N minus one. These were problems that could have been avoided if patches were applied. I've worked in organizations where databases, Oracle databases, I'll pick on that one as an example, were several releases behind because the database admin did not want to hurt his database. It was never the database, it was his database. Three revs back, uh, within those three revs, multiple remote execution vulnerabilities. So these are things you need to take into account. And seeing as how I'm between you and beer, I'll switch over to questions at this point, if anybody has any. <laughs> 